Hey, good afternoon, or good evening. I guess it could be good morning. Um, I'm Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum. This is Barbell Medicine. YouTube live stream, Instagram live. We're doing questions, standard deal. So if you have a question, and it's uh, one that I feel like answering, I'll probably answer it today. Um, anyway, good to see everybody. What day is it? Sunday. Uh, new... Uh, hypertrophy templates come out tomorrow. I've got a newsletter dropping this week, so make sure to sign up for our newsletter if you're not yet subscribed. And uh, let's see, what else? Hope everyone's having a really good Sunday. Man, you know, my father said some, something offensive today. He, uh, he said, you, don't, you know, I'm really surprised you don't have a Keurig. <laughs> I said, Dad, come on, man. I can't be messing around with that junk. So, uh, all right. If you had to only drink coffee, if you had to only drink coffee or only beer for the rest of your life, oh, I'd choose coffee. I don't really like beer that much. It's not my favorite. So, um, coffee is my favorite. And, uh, you know, I would just do decaf in uh, the evening. So, there you go. Favorite cereal? Uh, this is another easy question. So I'm, you know, uh, I'm cinnamon toast crunch guy till I die. Problem is, it's not a real problem for me, but theoretically, if I was trying to reduce my dietary fat, you know, it's got two and a half grams or three grams per serving, something like that. So uh, in that case, I do, I go, I default to uh, cinnamon life checks or cinnamon life, yeah. So ginger raider on the tubes asks how much stronger does an untrained 40 year old have to get to say how much stronger does an untrained 40 year old have oh yeah this is such a strange question how much stronger does an untrained 40 year old have to get to get say 80 percent of the health benefits from barbell training so not probably not that strong i mean we don't have we don't know the number offhand but like to make the argument that a 300 pound squat makes you healthier than a 200 pound squat is silly, asinine even. Um, you, I could make an argument that the process of actually ex, you know, training regularly is probably health promoting. Um, it certainly is, you know, from an activity standpoint, but also, you know, uh, uh, actually the uh, uh, musculoskeletal benefits from from resistance training. But how much stronger, like in an absolute number, we don't have. I don't know. Or percentage increase, we don't have. We don't have that. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. How would you warm up for the singles and other sets on the competition list on the bridge two? I would do the whatever the rep um, prescriptions are for the week up until maybe like 10% under my planned single. And then I would take a warm-up single and then do the planned single. Yeah. Jack Farrell asks, is scapular winging a thing? Yeah, you can get scapular winging, medial or lateral. Usually if the uh, uh, the nerve that supplies the serratus anterior, which is the uh, middle subscapular nerve, also known as the long thoracic nerve, um, if that is injured, then you get scapular winging because the serratus anterior can't hold the uh, scapula flush to the rib cage. Um, if the trapezius has some sort of nerve injury, then you can have winging the other direction. That being said, there's no way to fix it other than to let the nerve heal. So any exercises designed to fix scapular winging that either is not there in the first place certainly won't work. But if it doesn't help um, um, the nerve regenerate, which exercise usually doesn't, um, uh, then, you know, you just got to wait for it to heal. So. <clears throat> Opinion, experiences on nootropics? Eh, that's too broad of a question. Um, my general response is most nootropics don't actually improve outcomes that you people are concerned with, and, and the, the people who are interested in nootropics could probably benefit from doing other health-promoting things in their life, such as sleep, having better sleep habits, um, not being on a restricted diet. Uh, when I say restricted, I mean by like restricting foodstuffs. They need to train more intelligently, not to get anxiety or... Uh, crippling fear over, you know, things like gluten or uh, stuff like that and not geek out about stuff like microdosing LSD. <laughs> those those things are probably uh, counteracting any positive benefit of uh, performance-enhancing um, um, 
uh, either supplements, foodstuffs, or behaviors. <sighs> Let's see. Can you give a spoiler about the new hypertrophy template? Who is the public of this template? I don't really know what that means, but it's a four-day template. And then we just updated uh, the, the formatting of our old template, make it uh, work better. So if you purchase the old template, you'll get the new one, the new three-day one. But we're also going to have a four-day one for people who want to train more or for folks who've already ran this particular template numerous times and probably need to step up to with increased volume and frequency. What exactly is a pulled muscle? That is a, not a diagnosis. So you have a strained muscle, you have a sprained ligament or tendon or joint potentially, although I don't, I think a diagnosis code make you specify the actual soft tissue structure, um, and you don't treat a pulled muscle at all. A muscle strain, you know, depending on the grade severity, will determine its intervention, but I don't treat them just routinely. How do I feel about hamstring isolation exercises? I don't feel about them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think if you can use them if you're trying to treat a tendinopathy and using a slow eccentric, or if you're a bodybuilder and you need to get in a bunch more volume, um, that's not terribly fatiguing. They can be useful, but not for a power lifter or strength trainer. Did I excel at the bread making? Yeah, I'm. you know, I'm okay at making bread. So there you go. Uh, my dad told me that it was really, really good bread. And so, you know, if pops, if it's pops approved, then we're good. Uh, have I been watching the games? Not at all. I haven't watched any of the games. Yeah. So my favorite event of the 2018 CrossFit Games will be the end of the 2018 CrossFit Games. Can you explain CNS fatigue when it comes to intensity, not volume, and how to deload accordingly? Uh, CNS, so there's three aspects of fatigue. One is peripheral, one is central. That would include CNS fatigue. And one is muscular damage. CNS fatigue or uh, central fatigue that occurs secondary to training is short-lived, like hours. It's not a thing that you would need to deload from. Um, it has to do with arousal states, has to do with uh, both depletion of certain um, things that uh, require time to replenish and also an accumulation of certain uh, metabolites that are required to reaccumulate. This is all in the uh, context of the brain and central nervous system, um, in addition to um, uh, psychological uh, sort of influences on performance. So you wouldn't deload from that. It don't. It doesn't last even a day. The the central fatigue aspects of uh, fatigue. So per, with uh, in respect to resistance training, anyway. So there you go. So if anyone tells you about CNS fatigue and that that's why you need to deload, you know that you're talking to an actual ignoramus. So there you go. When am I going to row 500 pounds? I've already rowed 495, yeah, just to a certain dominance, but it wasn't pretty enough to post on the internets. <clears throat> Let's see. What is my opinion? Oh, shoot. Uh, I know that you're not very fond of the ketogenic diet. That's not necessarily true. I just don't think it works better than any other diet. There are many proven health benefits of going keto. No, there are not. Yeah, there, so when you say proven health benefits, you would suggest that there are unique benefits to following a ketogenic diet that are not seen with other calorie-restricted diets that yield the same amount of compliance, and there are not. You could make a weak argument for people with type 1 diabetes that perhaps there is some additional evidence that suggests its efficacy in that particular population, but even that would be a really weak argument. So, the Bulgarian wolf, I think that you're wrong. Uh, whatever happened to the 2014 proposal for the starting strength coaches? Yeah, John Patrizzo uh, ran with that um, and has published some data. I believe it was presented at ACSM conference and is submitted for publication in the journal Medicine, Science, and Sports and Exercise. And uh, yeah, so that's good. Hello, Dr. Feigenbaum. What is your opinion on specialization phases in order to bring up a lagging body, body part? Not useful. For physique, you don't need to do that. Yeah. You just need more training. Is it worth going from the starting strength linear progression straight into hypertrophy template or go to the bridge? You could do either. Uh, none of it's going to change, you know, the, anything meaningful in a year's time. So for long-term development, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> 
when will Barbell Medicine and Mike T collaborate? Well, we've already done a few podcasts together. Um, I don't know what else we're supposed to collaborate on. We've got two separate businesses, you know? Man, I would love some Barbell Medicine t-shirts, but shipping to the UK is so oh expensive. Yeah. We'll have to bring some uh, we'll bring some over when we come to Europe. Hey Jordan, could you explain the correlation between strength and hypertrophy? Muscle cross sectional areas directly is the probably the most predictive function of muscular strength potential. Um, strength is specific, so displaying your ability your uh, contractile potential in the form of a one rep max is a specific test of strength. But that being said, having a bigger muscle helps you um, and is predictive. Uh, you know, there are people who are going to overperform who have that is they have smaller amounts of muscle mass than you'd otherwise predict based on their one RM performance. But um, having more muscle mass helps you get stronger for sure. Adductor Magnus pain from squatting doesn't hurt during deadlifts. I wouldn't do anything about that. I would still squat. Yeah. Any evidence to support or refute using active recovery, light ro light cycling, rowing, etc. on your off days? Well, it doesn't speed up recovery. Um, it improves your base level of conditioning, which improves your training, uh, the sort of threshold that you need to surpass to cause significant stress. So... It increases your overall fitness and uh, improving your tra level of training increases uh, or improves your recovery overall, but it doesn't actually like, you're just moving the legs helps you. No, it, rest is rest, but if, you know, any sort of activity has some amount of fatigue um, that it generates and sometimes that's beneficial and that it improves fitness adaptations and other times it's hurtful because the fatigue that it causes causes a, a worsening performance. Yeah. Uh, what's the disadvantage to go into the gym four times a week and doing five by five at eight of squat, press, bench, and deadlift every day as a post-novice program? Where does that stall out? Well, it depends on the person. Everybody's going to respond differently. Some people, that would be a you know rapid increase in training fatigue that they could not tolerate, and then that would that they would likely have pain that they would call an injury. Uh, secondary to that, that's possible, not definitive, but, you know, acute, really rapid, acute increases in training fatigue, that's definitely associated with uh, people reporting increased rates of pain. Um, no exercise variety also decreases the uh, uh, the stress of a given amount of training volume and a given amount of training intensity, so it might not actually work that well overall, only for a couple, you know, a couple of weeks. Um, so, it depends on what is the disadvantage compared to what is it is that better than not training sure but i i don't think that just doing five by five on everything just to make it simple has any benefit because simplicity doesn't necessarily work any better than complexity and people aren't able to follow simplistic uh training any better than they are what we what we do uh, complex training so um yeah i don't see any benefit to doing something suboptimal just because it's simple or just because you know it sounds easy to to tell people oh i'm just doing five by five of everything four days a week it's like i mean okay try it see what see what happens but i would never program that so so fun what you said about santa cruz seminar about the amounts of food oh yeah a lot of food that i'm eating yep there you go uh is it common oh shoot Ooh. Is it common for someone who gained six kilos to stall in upper body lifts after six weeks on starting strength? It's, you know, doesn't matter how much weight you gained without knowing anything else. Maybe starting strength look is is not the this sort of amazing novice program that everyone's going to respond to and do well with. So it doesn't surprise me that people. I mean, on average, the thing's going to last nine weeks. Okay, we call that three months for being favorable. Um, and on average, less than 2% of the population is going to run it correctly, but which doesn't seem to matter anyway, because the results are what they are in about nine weeks. So you saw that a little early and you only gained six kilos. You may still be underweight. You may have, you know, not necessarily responded terribly well to the program. That's fine. Just move on. It doesn't matter where you're at at six months of training. It doesn't matter where you're at at a year of training. You know, if someone says, oh, I really milked LP out and I, I squatted 140 kilos for three sets of five, the end of a year and a half. 
like, okay, cool. Like, uh, well, what did you squat in five years? Did you squat 600? Because if not, I don't know if wasting that extra time resetting and really trying to get to that 140 kilo squat on LP is necessarily useful. Like, what does it matter? So anyway, moving on. Dr. J, I think that name's taken. Dr. J, generally speaking, what do you recommend as the appropriate amount of carbs to consume daily per pound body weight? I don't. There's no, it depends on the person and the context. There's no general recommendation there. Yeah. For men on TRT, how do you feel about estrogen as far as needing to control it? 100% depends on the person. Some say not to mess with it unless there are side effects. That's true. That's true. If it's, I mean, and then if you say if it's in range or above range, it depends on if you're experiencing any symptoms, you know, and that's clinical clinicians to uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, judgment on that. Yeah, there. Let's put it this way: so lab values need to be associated clinically, right? And so if you have a lab value that is way outside the normal range, and you have a a, a thought that, hey, man, this can be harmful long term. Well, yeah, you probably need to control that. So for instance, high blood pressure is just a number, right? But if it's high and it's prolonged, it's high for, you know, many, many years, that can cause issues. And so you'd want to do something to control it, even though you don't have any symptoms with it. Um, on the other hand, you know, having something like an AST value, that's a liver enzyme, also it's a mitochondrial enzyme in the muscles, um, having a, an enzyme on your uh, elevation on a lab panel is meaningless like especially if you exercised in the last week so it's only meaningful if it's really elevated along with a bunch of other things and there's a pathology that you have that, that would be worked up afterwards and then you would treat that so you don't just necessarily treat the lab value you got to correlate it clinically and estrogens like that too if it's one or two points outside the normal reference range i wouldn't i probably wouldn't treat it if it's three times the upper limit of normal i think it's probably something else unrelated to your trt so it depends you know this is why you should ask your doctor and not uh, do it on the internet <laughs> uh let's see how do i prevent hip cramps during the bench i would just move your feet Change your foot position. Go wider. Go forward. Go backwards. Get on your tippy toes. Something. Fix that. Yeah. Doc, have you ever heard of the Super Squats program? Yeah, you do heavy sets of heavy sets of twenty repetitions, and you're also supposed to drink a bunch of milk, and you're supposed to do dumbbell pullovers. I think it's a stupid program. Yeah, it's no better than anything else, and definitively worse based on you know existing principles and strength and conditioning. So it's gonna be a hard no for me. How should one approach weekly progression? I tend to try to add five pounds each week until I think my RPE is going up. I think that's still linear progression. And I think that as soon as you divorce yourself from linear progression, then you're the world is your oyster. Like, it just doesn't, like, if you add five pounds a week, okay, to whatever working set that you're going on, and, it, and you know, and that lasts six weeks, uh, then yeah, you've added 30 pounds to this working set. Did you get stronger? Well, I don't know. If the RPE goes up too, maybe not. Maybe you're just sandbagging it the first few weeks. Um, so I think the relative effort level is more tightly correlated to the training effect that you're, desi you're trying to get out of a training session than the absolute weight on the bar. Uh, that being said, yeah, sure, you would want to see performance increases on a regular basis if the reason why you were training was specific, like you wanted to get stronger as, demo as demonstrated by a squat bench deadlift press. So should that be every week? I don't know, every two weeks? Depends how, how advanced someone is. Um, I think you'd want to see a trend in improvement and things you're tracking. So estimate a 1RM, um, working sets that are near limit, you know, at nine, at eight, stuff like that. You can do that. But five pounds per week, I mean, that works if that's a small percentage increase. Just think about if you only pressed... Think if you only pressed 100 pounds, right, for, for a set of five, and the next week you did 105. Well, that's a 5% increase on the bar. That's substantial, and I don't think you'd see that week to week for many weeks. So you may have to, you know, maybe saying uh, a 1% or 2% increase on the bar is better. <clears throat> is there anything you now, disagree, you now agree with that you may have disagreed with in the fitness industry four to five years ago? Well, I'm sure. I just don't. Off the top of my head, I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure I do. How to build up grip strength after breaking a hand twice within five months in the same bone, fourth metacarpal. 
fourth metacarp? What are you punching, Caitlin? What are you punching? Yeah, I think just training the deadlift is going to be the best thing you can do. Also, make sure you're doing pull-ups and chin-ups. Um, and using your grip, it'll get back to normal. Sure. <sighs> best method for cutting and maintaining strength, having good programming. Yeah. If I do hook, grip, competition deadlifts, what should I do for RDLs? I would do straps. Yep. Benjamin, if a healthy individual donates a kidney, do they have to alter their protein intake? There's no data on that, no. Is there some sort of adaptation period post-operatively? Uh, I mean, yeah, you'll go through some transient hyperfiltration post-op, but not necessarily that would be um, correlated to any sort of dietary practices. I mean, they're going to recommend eating less protein, some of them, or some if they say anything at all, but there's no data supporting that. Yep. Hey, Jordan, is it true what Mark Ripito said that doing chin-ups will make tendonitis go away? I think, well, <laughs> um, okay, so so I, I just feel like we need to make this crystal clear. Pain as a result of a tendinopathy is not always if that if you have a tendinopathy, then you have pain. Right, So you can have tendon damage, a tendinopathy, and have no pain. But if you do have pain, then doing chin-ups, are they likely to improve your pain? Well, maybe. If you have a high belief system in that particular exercise uh, and that particular protocol, then sure. But is there any mechanical thing that's occurring during chin-ups that make elbow tendinopathy necessarily better? I think not usually and the other deal is it's hard to do eccentrics on chin-ups because they're it, they're much harder to do i would actually think that rows with a, a tempo eccentric or a, or a machine-based work would actually be easier to do and potentially more efficacious since we actually do have evidence that the eccentric stuff is, is much better so there you go so at home, why is it better to finish up the last four weeks of 12-week strength and go to another program that contains more volume? Because if you skip the intensification phase, then you will, you're will you not as sensitive to volume as you otherwise would be if you did the, sensi the uh, uh, intensification phase, which is, I think I told you that in a personal DM, which is interesting. I feel like that was a sufficient answer. <clears throat> Do I think nerve glides help? Nope. <laughs> or work? Nope. Uh, is transcutaneous electron... Oh, is TENS bullshit? I mean, it's placebo. It doesn't do anything mechanically. But if you believe it's going to work, maybe it's helpful. Low risk overall, unless the frequency is too high. If the frequency is too high, it actually reduces recovery, which reduces performance because it actually induces fatigue. So, Let's see. Thoughts on intermittent fasting? Uh, you should do it all the time in between meals. Just fast intermittently. So, you know, uh, let's see, in a kinetic, what is a kinet kinetic chain? You can Google that. And how does it relate to the press and the bench press? It's a very starting strength question of you. The kinetic chain uh, of the press is from the hands all the way to the feet and bench press from the shoulder to the barbell. So, yep. Yeah. Any thoughts on the video of the guy kicking the kid for deadlifting? I actually didn't see it yet. I saw like things of it on Facebook, so I didn't actually check the video yet. Why tempo slash paused variations aren't main lifts? They have they are in some of our programs. So if we bought the seven week GPP hypertrophy template, do we just enter our email for the newly formatted one? No, we already have it. We already got your email. We'll send it to you. Do you still use hip drive for your clients? Mm, sometimes. If it if needed. If active recovery isn't a thing, then is a complete week of rest better than a low volume uh, slash intensity deload? Depends on what your goals are for that week. If you want to detrain, sure, just don't train for a week. That'd be a good way to, to go about things. If you want to uh, reduce your skill at doing the movement that you view as important based on your training, then yeah, don't train for a week. You can do that. At a seminar, you said you had hip issues due to training on a sloped, uneven floor. Can you explain how badly was it off level? Asking because I train in a concrete garage and it's not level. Yeah, it was really unlevel. Like, it was significantly slanted. It's a deuce gym in Venice, California. 
It's not an old car repair shop. And, uh, yeah, so squatting unevenly for a series of weeks. Maybe had this weird thing in my left hip that went away when I started squatting on a straight floor, even floor. Well, presumably even. I don't think people are, you know, leveling it uh, and using, you know, high-level technology to do that. So, Cole James, is overtraining a serious concern? For resistance training, it's of no concern to me. So I think you can do really stressful stuff right? That produces a bunch of fatigue, but that fatigue does not result in the fitness adaptations that you were selecting for, that you were desiring. And so your performance doesn't go up. And so, yeah, you may feel tired, but you may not get any better. Uh, that doesn't mean you're overtrained and that you need to do less. It just means you need to do something that's more appropriate or that you respond to better. So there are things that are really hard, really difficult, really fatiguing, really stressful that don't make you better. Lighting your entire body on fire, for instance. Uh, doing regular Texas method. A uh, barbell medicine shirt came in the mail yesterday, crushed a, pest PR, a press PR, and got my first interview invite for medical school. Dude, I think that's I think that's uh, it's a conspiracy. Big big pharma is working through us to get to you <laughs> via a t shirt. That's awesome, man. Congrats. Per Thomas. Thor Sager, any opinion about dextrose or fructose after training for a carb supplement? I think both are trash. Some evidence says it's supposed to make you uptake the carbohydrates faster. No, actually, that's not true at all. The evidence clearly states that taking dextrose and or fructose, uh, even with amino acids or salt or whatever, does not empty the gut faster, empty the stomach into the small intestine faster than your regular mixed meal. In fact, it's slower because it's hyperosmotic. So you can do highly branched cyclic dextrins like the Targo, which would empty the stomach faster and then get into the bloodstream faster and then get to the muscle, liver, et cetera, et cetera, faster. But that's not really a concern for anybody in this stream. If you're competing multiple times per day, maybe, but not if it's short endurance events or short uh, multimodal events like CrossFit. Even then, it still I think that's more smoke and mirrors and you know people like to think they're doing something beneficial for their for their performance and so there's definitely a placebo in there but I wouldn't recommend using a carb supplement for most folks yeah don't you ship to Denmark uh I don't think so no what are my criticisms of the barbell prescription the entire discussion on programming um and why you should do lower volume and that the, the idea that older, the concept that older people are volume sensitive, intensity dependent, that not only is it a meaningless statement, it, the way the context where it's being used is that, you know, older folks should do less volume because they're volume sensitive. That's not the case in general. Most folks who are untrained and elderly are volume resistant, meaning they need more training, more volume to get the same response as a younger person who is uh, untrained. Everybody's intensity dependent if you're talking about strength performance on a heavy squat, bench, deadlift, press, something like that, a skill like that, because <laughs> you need to practice the test. So yeah, you can get a bunch of uh, 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 strength development and a bunch of uh, hypertrophy development at lower intensities, but to be able to perform a true to life one RM, you're gonna have to practice heavy singles. And so that, yeah, you're intensity dependent. It's like published in Duh Weekly. <laughs> what do you eat on a regular basis? Obviously this is variable, but as a general rule of thumb, what do your meals look like? I don't really even know how to answer that. It's like a protein in there and a bunch of carbs. And some fats, like that's it's a useless kind of thing. Like, I don't know what you want me to tell you. Do muscular imbalances cause bad posture? No, the entire human skeleton at its optimal performance level is imbalanced. Okay? Your quadriceps are much stronger than your hamstrings, for instance. Your abdomen, your, uh, the anterior musculature of your abdomen is uh, uh, stronger um, in certain positions than your erectors and vice versa. Uh, the anterior aspect of your pe uh, of your clavipectoral area, your shoulder girdle, can be stronger in certain positions than your your uh, posterior aspect. Like the body is not a balanced thing that somehow becomes imbalanced over a year over the time and requires correction. That's uh, that's 
cue that's a that's a red flag for oh I'm about to get sold some bullshit. So pass. David, also it's been a year since you got me off stretching. I want to say and I want to say thanks for all the extra time. Hey, there you go. You're welcome. <clears throat> If in a caloric surplus, I'm trying to slowly gain weight, should I do carb cycling method? You can. Sure, that's fine. When I use a thick squat bar, I get elbow pain when squatting. However, when I use a standard power bar, I don't. Have I seen this in any of my athletes? Nope. Why would you think this is the case? I think that you potentially carry the thicker bar in a different position than the thinner bar, if I had to guess. Yeah. Ashley Cola. Hey, Jordan, I have such a hard time keeping the bar from sliding down my back while squatting. What do you think is causing this? Well, I think you could. the bar could be sitting too low. That's possible. Two, you could be squatting in a tank top or, you know, fa fa uh, fashionable Lululemon racer back shirt instead of a thick cotton shirt. The barbells knurling that you're using may not be sharp enough, in which case there's a equipment issue. And I'm going to guess that you don't use chalk on your back. And so I think being sweaty without a cotton shirt on, wearing tank top, using a shitty bar, those would all be things, reasons why the bar moves. Jordan, how many days per week do I weight train? Four days a week. What are my current lift numbers for deadlift, squat, press, and bench press? Well, the singles I did last week were 525 on a squat. That was about a 7.5 or 8. 685 on a deadlift, which was an 8. Uh, press, I did 271, and I benched 395 for a single at 8. So, yeah, the squat's coming back um, since I had it re-switched to low bar, but strong enough, I guess. Hey, Jordan, I know this happened a few weeks back, but what do you think about the Cardinals getting rid of Matheny? I actually didn't know that. Will we ever go to the World Series again anytime soon? I would guess. I mean... You know, when we got rid of Joe Torre, people said the same thing. So, but shortly thereafter, we went back to the World Series. So, I think it'll be fun. Mark the Ripper Toe. That's funny. Have you been doing your fives, son? Well, I do fours and sixes, so that probably averages out to fives. <laughs> Uh, CrossFit is going to start letting transgender people compete with the gender they identify with. Am I alone in thinking that's kind of crazy? Honestly, I don't think it's crazy. I think that it's going to lead to unintended secondary consequences um, that I think I'll probably keep to myself at this time. The, the issue is this. It's very difficult to define what is a woman and what is a man, period. Like, this is a definition that it encompasses all cases and there's no gray zone there are no gray zones well consider like women who have some sort of mutation in the uh, their uh, the enzymatic processes that create certain steroid hormones um, this can be associated with uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia for instance or uh, non-functioning y, y chromosome or androgen sensitivity syndrome it's 180 times more common in elite international female athletics um, than in the general population. And so those women have f the physiological milieu that is much more similar to what we classically uh, think is you know, a male physiological milieu. And so is it male or female? Like, I don't know. I'm not here to decide. And, and you know, the uh, IAF, the governor of, uh, of all like track events and, you know, that uh, that are held worldwide, and the IOC, the Inter International Olympic Committee, and the NCAA. Nobody else wants to define what a woman, what a woman or a man is. Um, the IAF actually just recently lowered the max hormonal hormone uh, testosterone level that a female athlete can have. Now they don't do any chromosome testing. They don't do any physical exams. They'll do a, a hormone panel and say that if her testosterone is high. When it's still lower than the low end of, you know, the male male uh, uh, hormone uh, panel, then she can't compete unless she chemically castrates herself, which I feel like is silly because they say it's unfair. Well, is it fair that some people have long legs or short arms or long torsos for sports like swimming, for instance, or long legs for running or, you know, big hands for, uh, you know, 
track and field sports. I don't know if that's fair or not. I don't get to decide. Neither do you, right? You know, who's making this judgment? Is it fair that somebody has a better socioeconomic status, has access to better coaching facilities and training opportunities than somebody else? Like, who gets to decide? Sports aren't fair. Um, that being said, sports are arbitrarily contrived competitions based on a set of rules that don't necessarily have to make sense. Um, so should you allow transgender athletes to compete again where they identify? I think that's PC, sure. Um, but I wouldn't do it that way. If it's me, I think you have an open class that's whatever. Look, you're this, this is run what you brung. There's no men and women's class. It's just open. You're in the open. You don't drug test. Do whatever you want to do. And there's a restricted class. In a restricted class, you know, you have to say oh, you were born a woman as defined by your birth, uh, uh, your uh, identification at birth, um, and is drug tested. That's how I do it. But you know, that's not perfect either. I get it. I think that any simplistic sort of response to that question is short-sighted and conveys uh, um, a lack of education, a lack of thinking about this problem so is there any truth in inheritance of male pattern baldness from your mother's father well it's genetic certainly there's and it's not just from your mother's father it's from everybody whose genetic material makes contributes to yours so do i think that a slight calorie surplus is enough for strength training as opposed to what ripito advocates i think that it depends on context, and I think that rapidly gaining weight for most folks is not a great idea just for the short-term strength gain because I think the person who responds very, very well to strength training it was likely going to respond very, very well to strength training regardless of how much weight they gained. Um, that's why you see, you know, some people who are 170 pounds who can, you know, squat well into the mid 300s at the end of LP, and you're like, how did that happen? Like, well, that person was going to respond well to training regardless. And somebody would say, well, if they gained more weight, they would do better. I'm like, maybe maybe not, you know, because I don't know if you could actually respond any better than they did. Should they gain weight long term? Well, if they want to be the strongest person they, they want to be, sure. But to extend LP by a couple weeks? Me. <laughs> if muscle cross-sectional area is the main predictor of strength, why isn't all strength training hypertrophy training? That's... It, so muscle cross-sectional area is the best predictor that we have just uh, from anthropometric uh, sort of measurements, but you have to practice your sport in order to be able to perform well. So for sports like powerlifting, you actually have to do a lot of practice of the heavy squat, bench, deadlift, and press, you know, to get better at the neuromuscular adaptations that wane as you become more experienced. Um, why isn't all strength training hypertrophy training? A good strength training program in the context of a strength athlete, a good portion of it is going to be hypertrophy promotion. And as an untrained person, everything promotes hypertrophy. And as you get more and more advanced, you're going to need more and more work that ha uh, generates more and more volume and fatigue to drive that hypertrophy process. That's why three sets of five doesn't work when you're actually, you know, not a novice anymore. Maybe you not even if you're a novice. So... <clears throat> If someone kills themselves the last few weeks of LP just to try and lift heavier weight and have horrible symptoms of mental, physical fatigue, lack of focus, appetite, loss of libido, etc., what would you classify this as? Training-induced adjustment disorder. It's a mental issue. doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It just means that you were rating the effort in your training very, very high, and that has had a negative effect on your life. And for what? You got an extra 10 pounds on your squat. I hope you squat 600 in a few years. You know, that's that's what I'm saying. It's like it just really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where your weights end up after three months or four months or five months or six months or 12 months of training. It just doesn't matter, okay? That's so early on. It doesn't matter. And you shouldn't make training decisions based on the absolute performance at three months, six months, and 12 months of like day zero to, oh, now I'm at a year of training. Like, someone's like, hey, I've just been training for a year, and I've just pulled uh, 405. I'm like, hey, that's cool, but I can't, I don't know right now if you're going to be a superstar athlete in the strength field, okay, or not. It's just too soon to tell, and making any training decisions based on your response in that first, you know, or trying to maximize numbers in that first year 
I think is short selling, uh, is short sighted and, and selling yourself short. Two shorts there. So you should set yourself up for long term development by uh, lots of practice uh, in uh, multiple different movements that are similar to ones that you deem important. So you'd have a you know substantial amount of squat variations at some point in your training early on. On pressing variations, you have a bunch of general physical skills that you would develop over a long period of time. You develop good conditioning base. You would develop, you know, really try to develop a good hypertrophy base as you develop as an athlete. And so that's that's how you would do it. That's one of the reasons why LP is not that great. So, all right, moving on. All right. Uh, oh my gosh. Will we ever see you on America Ninja Warrior? No. Look, man, there's no Jewish competitors on American Ninja Warrior. We're behind the camera, or we're, like, accounting, or we're, uh, you know, doing something. <laughs> when you do the Valsalva maneuver, do you just think about breathing into your belly and compressing the air tight? Uh, no. If I were to have a pneumo, like a, a, you know, breathe in a bunch of air into my stomach and rupture my stomach, that would be potentially fatal. So I think about taking a breath into my lungs and squeezing everything tight. What does that mean, squeeze everything tight? It means everything. Just bear down. Squeeze. Brace. Tight. Whatever you need to do. But I think about specific cues with related to bracing, I think are mostly too generalized and not specific enough to be meaningful for an individual person. So I just don't do them. <clears throat> Hey, Jordan, is there any hope in fixing a slight pectus excavatum in a 28-year-old without surgery? Oh, but, you know, what do you do, not train? Any way to clean your body up faster from THC before a drug test? Not that's reliable. Maybe if you're going to be drug tested for illicit substances, don't do drugs. Hey, Jordan, after your 12-week strength program, do you have an off-season program? I think you should do the hypertrophy template. Yep. Close friends had a stroke recently at 23 years old. At their young age, would you personally be more optimistic on, on a near full recovery? I don't know if I could say anything intelligent about that. Depends why they had a stroke, you know, and how bad it was. <clears throat> what are your thoughts on using myo reps for squats and deadlifts? I use them regularly. Let's see. What is it like being internet famous? I don't know if I'm internet famous yet. Although, you know, when I travel, people recognize me. So maybe you're right, Mike. Uh, it's cool. I mean, I don't know. I never thought in a million years that anybody would know who I am. So here we are. Uh, do I get annoyed by all the comments about starting strength in yourself? Um, I get annoyed when people refuse to think, right? So I certainly think that what we're saying is correct, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't say it. And, but people won't think for themselves or even be open to thinking about things, period. I mean, that's the whole problem with starting strength right now. They won't think about things and they won't question their own methodology. And we're posing questions that they can't answer and then just dismiss. And that's fine. That's do that at your own peril. But people will be like, man, we like starting strength, man. Why are you guys being so mean? Like, we're not being mean. We're just questioning things that need to be questioned, just like we question our own stuff on a regular basis and make changes as necessary. That's this is a sign of, you know, enlightenment. <laughs> like, this is what the people do that are really keyed in and, and intelligent about things and, and not trying to just do things out of uh, convention or you know, keep doing the same thing because that's what you've always done. So I, I am annoyed by people's refusal to think. That is what is annoying to me. Um, if people want to overblow the starting strength versus barbell medicine thing, that's fine. Like, I'm not concerned. Uh, I'm happy to engage in a public debate with Ripito and Reynolds and Baker and Sullivan about all this stuff. Um, we've asked them multiple times and been dismissed, laughed at, and then mocked personally, which is fine. Like, more people read our stuff and listen to our stuff anyway. I'm not concerned. So, <sighs> let's see. Any plans on expanding in Europe? Um, I mean, we're going to come there for seminars. If you're in London, you can go see Carl Ragavan. He's in London. 
will be competing September 28th. That's eight weeks from now. Uh, training without wraps. I would start squatting with wraps probably pretty soon. Yeah. I'm super skinny and have a hard time gaining weight. I heard of Gomad. Would you think it will help me gain weight? It could. I probably... Or should you drink a gallon of olive oil a day first? You probably do both at the same time. Yeah, just olive oil and milk. Just do a gallon of each. So you probably won't need to eat anything else. You know, it's protein, carbs, fat, and more fat. So if you just, you know, do a gallon of each a day, it's probably fine. <laughs> do you have... Do you recommend any... Do I recommend adding a percentage of weight on the bridge at any point? Not uniquely, no. In Denmark, oh, cool. We do ship to Denmark, dope. Lots of animosity towards Sully for some reason. Yeah, I think I am upset that he refuses to think and has made uh, many comments towards us publicly. And we... <laughs> it's like, come on, man. Wanted to start BJJ after novice linear progression, but after reading the bridge, I don't know how the added stress will affect training. Any recommendations? My recommendations are to figure out what you actually want in your life. If you're not a competitive power lifter, meaning you're not getting paid or laid for for competing as a competitive power lifter, then what does it really matter what your one rep max does for at, at any point? You want to get stronger over time because that's personally rewarding to you. That's fine. Okay. But if you also think you'll enjoy BJJ because of other benefits, then do it, man. It's all good. You know? Yeah, your strength training might suffer, but if is being strong the only thing that's valuable in your life? Like, I mean, if so, that's cool. Then don't do BJJ. So. Strong first. Hey, what's up, Mr. Pena? How you doing? How detailed or individualized are the programs for group training programs? Um, it depends. When people go out for a meet, they usually get their own, you know, meet prep the last four or six weeks before the meet. Um, otherwise, it's more group, you know, each people are separated into like groups, and so they'll have similar programming. Why can you leg press a lot more weight than you can in a squat? Uh, so there's just less... Um, uh, well, the range of motion overall is a little less. Uh, secondary to that is you don't have, there's no balance component. Um, also, on a 45 degree incline uh, leg press, the gravity's working a little bit different too. It's not just straight down. So, I mean, gravity's still working straight down, but the actual uh, work you're doing against gravity is not just in the vertical, uh, uh, in a vertical line. So it's, uh, <clears throat> you know, so there's, you're, if you're leg pressing 900 pounds, the amount of force that you have to produce is not necessarily the same. And if you had to squat 900 pounds, you'd have to you'd produce a whole lot more force for squatting 900 than leg pressing 900. Unless it was a vertical leg press, that would be more similar to a squat. In an Instagram live, you dismissed a claim as that's more Stu McGrill crap or something like that. I like that people get more aggressive when they requote me. I like that's a good quality to have. It's like... If I said something like, that's more Stu McGill stuff, and you say, that's more Stu McGill shit, then somebody's going to be like, look, this guy is such a jerk. So let's keep doing that. Uh, in any event, uh, I don't remember what the claim was, but what do you think of his work? I don't like it. Why do you not like it? <laughs> there you go. So you already know I don't like it. Why do you not like it? Because it, uh, refu it goes against the biopsychosocial model of pain, um, which we know to be much more accurate representation of why pain occurs and therefore how to treat it. It also uh, suggests that there is a pathology, that, you know, something mechanical, the level of the back that needs to be fixed and need to be, you need to do these exercises that are a waste of time and don't help. I mean, the evidence, there was even a really small test that showed that Stu McGill's big three didn't do anything for back pain. But, you know, of course, the, the uh, authors of the study said, well, it's reasonable because it's reasonable to do these exercises because it's low risk. It's like, well low risk of what? Wasting time. It's, not, it's, it's high risk for wasting time. And um, yeah, the, the, I think one of his books is called The Back Mechanic. It's like, like there's something wrong with your back and you have to fix it. It doesn't help further the conversation about what's causing the pain, the pain experience. And uh, so overall, I think it's more harmful than helpful. Yeah. <sighs> Let's see, Jordan, yesterday was my first meet and placed silver. Oh, cool. Congratulations, man. Do I ever get so fatigued your muscles just cramp 
and you can't squat? Uh, no, that's never happened to me. Is sleep hygiene beneficial, like sleeping in a completely in completely dark room, taking a hot shower before bed? I don't think taking a hot shower before bed is part of sleep hygiene. In fact, that'd be the opposite because if your core temperature is elevated, it's going to be more difficult to get to sleep. But if you're asking, does sleeping in a quiet, dark room that's cool, you know, that there's not random noise that uh, would signify a micro arousal, not drinking a bunch before bed, not having caffeine, you know, soon before bedtime, um, not uh, reading or uh, watching TV or doing other potentially stimulating activities besides sex and sleep in bed. If you're asking if that is that good, yeah, I think so. <clears throat> what do you think of Shaco style training, I meaning submaximal, essentially working around RP3? That is a misrepresentation of Shaco training. His percentages are in the 70s, you know, high 60s, low 70s for some of the work, and then also some of the work is plus 80%. So. That wouldn't be RP3. So my opinion of you doing Shaco is probably don't do it. Hey, Jordan, massive fan. Hey, thanks, man. Recently joined the forum. I'm nearing the end of my LP following Grayskull. When is the Barbell Medicine LP template coming out? It's never coming out because we're not going to do a linear progression. But the novice program will come out fairly soon. But you're not a novice any longer, so you should move on, Alistair. What are your favorite flat shoes for deadlifting? Uh, we use the Nike uh, Davinos. That's just what we're using now. I don't know if they're anything special, but I like them enough. Hi, Jordan. Very interested in hearing your opinion on the ethics of eating meat. I don't think, I don't have any thoughts on the ethics of eating meat. I don't think it's unethical. Uh, I think that nearly the our entire existence is based upon... Um, arbitrary sort of uh, uh, meaning that we attach to different things. And, uh, you know, we have sort of cornered ourselves into, into a place agriculturally where we need to do domestication of animals for farming. Uh, we need to use um, different strategies to produce a lot of food for the entire world. We need to... Um, use certain chemicals to grow our food that aren't harmful but you know people are like well what do you think about this i'm like i don't think anything about it this is where we ended up and then i don't have a problem with eating meat and i don't have a problem with um you know the way that the animals are treated necessarily i don't want animals to suffer unduly but at the same time like how, how would you go about remedying the situation you not eating the meat is not necessarily doing anything this is subsidized this is a government level you know thing um so bigger changes need to occur if that's your your issue. And um, I think that the food system at large probably needs to be refined. Just just like a lot of other things. But me personally, doesn't I don't it doesn't keep me up at night. Just found out I'm pregnant. Congratulations. Doctor told you not to lift more than twenty pounds while working out. Does the research suggest that lifting heavy while pregnant is detrimental to myself or the baby? Absolutely not. I can't believe that your doctor said that. That seems ridiculous. American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, which is where most of these recommendations come from, suggests that you can pretty much do whatever you want. You can search the public bulletin uh, yourself. It's freely available. But we don't know if it's uh, uh, harmful to resistance train or to do high-intensity exercise, although it says that you can do that in the ACOG bulletin. The reason why we don't know is because there hasn't been any, like, you know, controlled trials for this. And they, there's been the case reports don't exist showing that, you know, women was deadlifting heavy and then spontaneously had uh, a ruptured her placenta and lost the baby or something like that. We don't have that doesn't exist. So you would expect if um, there was a big problem with this stuff that there would be multiple like case report after case report after case report. But it's just not. And uh, that being said, I can't just say, hey, you know what, just do whatever you want. So I think, you know, there's a risk of not exercising. Uh, there's benefits to exercising. Um, there's an unknown risk to being pregnant in general, and certainly with any sort of exercise in general, there, we don't know what the risk is. I, I don't suspect that it's high, but I can't say for sure. And there are known benefits to exercising while being pregnant. So the 20-pound thing is arbitrary. That's pulled out of thin air. So we just really need to have this conversation with the doctor, you know. 
Thoughts on full body training every day, seven days a week as an intermediate? I think that it is unlikely that somebody fresh off the novice progression, so post-novice, would require seven days a week of training, even though I do like full body programs. Yeah. Thoughts on Stan Efferdine's vertical diet and his general approach to nutrition? Uh, both, I think, are bad. Large focus on micronutrients. Yeah, I think that's harmful to people. And uh, his sort of, his he's sowing seeds of, uh, discordance, uh, sowing seeds of um, uh, questioning legitimate science, and he's not a scientific person, so I think that's net negative as far as um, how it affects the public. Yeah. Why does beta alanine cause a tingling effect? We think that's due to uh, um, prostaglandin release. Yeah. Similar to niacin. Would you recommend to run one of your 12 ways to skin the Texas method? Yeah, you could. Sure. Is it reasonable to try and raise HDL with dietary changes alone, say from 45 to 60? I mean, potentially, yeah. But 45 to 60, is, that's... If you're less than 45, that's a problem. You know, but going from 45 to 50, does your risk change? I don't know. Certainly not from 50 to 60, necessarily. Not on keto, are there any significant dangers to keto? Sure, yeah, the high dietary fat intake may not be tolerated by someone fam with familial hypercholesterolemia or trig hypertriglyceridemia or somebody who's uh, at risk or has inter uh, uh, overt insulin resistance and that since that high fat meal can actually worsen um, insulin resistance acutely uh, and chronically. Uh, just, and the adherence rates are worse, so... There was a debate that a urologist said that even two liters of water a day is too much for a kidney. What to say to prove them wrong? Don't say anything. This person's already made up their mind, and they're a urologist. A ask for a citation. Just, where's the citation? Oh, I'll get it when I get home. Sick, bro. <laughs> Hey, Jordan, in the absence of resistance training, does a high-protein diet versus a low-protein diet help with help maintain muscle loss? Yeah, it seems seems to pre uh, prevent uh, the negative protein balance associated with uh, bed rest. Sure. Do I think a lot of physicians use tendonitis as a default diagnosis for a lot of injuries? Mm, probably not as much as strain. Sure. What do I think about men's scores and the CrossFit total, especially the press? I think that it's really impressive. Um, you know, that the folks who finish towards the top and the folks that finish towards the bottom, I don't think are necessarily strength athletes. So I think after the criteria, after the 30 muscle ups, and then in the heat doing that uh, under the timed conditions is reasonably impressive. And, uh, yeah, I mean, 12.55, I think, was the winning total. The guy, And then Vellner, who did not win, but did deadlift 5.95 after all that? That's impressive. <clears throat> oh, hey, I've been here for an hour. All right, I'm going to go back to work. You guys have been great. So, hey, if you're on Instagram Live, thanks for tuning in. If you're on YouTube, check out the live stream. Thank you for tuning in. Comment for the algorithm gains. We're going to try to blow this thing up. And uh, we'll catch you guys next time. All right. See you.